Good morning. Thanks for uh, inviting me down here to give a little presentation on Triple Crown. When I tried to find out exactly what the topic was, the, uh, I was kind of told to just give a little history of the company, about myself, what we do, and then we'll open this up for questions. So, um, with the I'm going to give a, just a little presentation, and I, you've kind of heard my bio there, and I just wanted to go through a couple things uh, about myself personally. I'm local to the area. I was born in uh, Harrisburg, and I went to uh, Central Dolphin High School. When I graduated, I had no intentions of going to college, and I thought I would just build houses and, and make a living. And uh, so in 80, I did go to Villanova University. Graduated there in, in the Commerce and Finance School, and you'd think I'd go into some sort of business line along that, and I didn't. I came out, I worked for my dad one year, and during those discussions, I had no intentions of going to law school, but I ended up going to University of Toledo College of Law. So you would think, you know, having a law degree, you'd probably get into the legal business, and I worked for a summer down in uh, Philadelphia for a large insurance defense firm, and that was the one thing I was absolutely sure I was not going to do, and that was practice law. So finishing law school, I went off to uh, New York City, so coming from central Pennsylvania and then going out to Toledo, which was all but flat cornfields. I ended up in New York City and uh, living in Manhattan for a year and met some very interesting people. And this was the first time that Columbia had a master's in real estate development. Back then, everybody was just doing MBAs, and then they started having these specializations. And I was the first graduating class out of Columbia with the uh, master's in real estate development. And from that, I. Um, Came back to Harrisburg, I was married at that time, and uh, met my wife in Toledo, and we, she was working, and she, was a, she is a doctor, and she was at Penn State. I was up at Columbia, we had a child, and I came back and started working for uh, Triple Crown Corporation, which was uh, started by my father. And there's a little history here that I, I can't quite tell you the, um, this little video clip will be a lot better for you to get the history of how this company got named. How does a construction company get named Triple Crown Corporation? So if I can run this thing. This is a little clip from ABC Wide World of Sports and my dad's part of the narration. I think I'll need a little help there with the sound. Yeah, sometimes it's like if you keep like that. See what I can do. Uh, let's see. So this is how. Um, additional settings. There's usually like a sound. Okay, maybe that sound clip then. Try it one more time. Should show some sort of menu for sound emerging. Let me just check if you have sound on the computer just to minimize for a second. Sure. Yeah. Sometimes it's just a little picky with these settings. Yeah, it looks good. Um, yeah, usually the sound is automatically turned on to display. So I'm not sure why it's not popping this time. Sorry about that. Try. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll just try it if you want to just talk over it. I will. All right. So, sorry about that. Yeah, I don't know why the regular sound isn't working otherwise. All right. Well, you will you can go to our website, and this video is uh, embedded there. You can click on it. It's a little three-minute clip. but. Uh, my father was very entrepreneurial, uh, first generation you know, Italian American. Um, he didn't graduate high school, so he worked his way, you know, just he worked in the steel mills in Stilton, fought in Korea, came back, started, if you ever saw the movie Tin Man, he started selling uh, roofing and siding. He was one of the, when aluminum siding was a brand new thing in, the, in America in the 50s. So that's how he got into construction business. 
but he is an absolute uh, horse aficionado or degenerate, depending on which way you, you look at that, and he absolutely loves the racetrack. So part of his plan was Seattle Slough is one of the Triple Crown winners, and Seattle Slough was undefeated. And he's still the only undefeated Triple Crown winner, so American Pharaoh, who just won this year, has been defeated. But Triple Seattle Slew never was. So my dad bought $2,000, $2 tickets at the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont. So, of course, the first race paid like two eighty. dollars the next race paid like $2.30, and up at the Belmont, Seattle Slough was a sh sure winner, and it hardly paid the price, the $2 bet back. So he had the picture of the jockey winning at the Belmont with Seattle Slough. The jockey signed it, and he sold those as collector's items. So he had 2,000 of these framed, signed, mounted. Total cost was probably 10 bucks, six dollars for the tickets, four dollars for the framing. And he sold them for 175 dollars each through across the country. So I think, in his own way, he probably made more money on that race than any man in America with his investment of uh, $12,000. So that was where the seed money for Triple Crown Corporation started. And then my dad, who was doing aluminum roofing and siding at that point in time, went on to build a house or two, and then he went on to um, start doing some smaller development projects. And here's the clicker, so if I can get back to my program here. All right. I, thank you. And then you can just All right. Sorry about that. No problem. So anyways, this is why we have IT departments, right? <laughs> So with Triple Crown, who are we today? We are developers. So we acquire ground, we do the infrastructure, we do the planning, the improvements, and we develop industrial properties, commercial properties, and residential properties. So we're also builders. We just don't do the site improvement work. We actually do the construction of the units. And we have built anything from single family homes up to 400,000 square foot distribution facilities. And we're also property managers. So we develop, we build, and then we manage the assets that we have created. Um, and that's you know the property management's renting, leasing, collecting the rents, everything that's associated with maintaining the asset. So our mission is to provide excellence in real estate services. And that mission statement was developed because we are such a broad range of company. But our whole goal is to provide excellence in real estate services. So the we have core values, and this is, comes right out of our strategy booklet that we've developed, and the core values are you know, tenets and principles and beliefs that help us shape our culture and who we are and what we want to be as a company. This, these core values are really how we judge people, how we hire people, how we pick quality partners and the contractors that we want to work with. So customer service commitments, one of the core values and we really have um, the customer confidence in us is our top priority. Everybody, you know, it's all about the customer, but it's all about people, the people in your company. So we have customers that we think they're outside the people we're building for, but we have internal customers that we're working with. How accounting deals with the construction guys, how the construction guys deal with the property management team, we really think about that we talk about responsiveness, and um, we want to serve all of our customers, internal and external, with a very high sense of urgency. We are very, our company, if, if we're known for one thing, is a very high sense of urgency. And we have a passion for excellence. We set what we hope are the highest standards of performance and professionalism in the industry. We've won multiple awards for you know, a company that operates predominantly in central Pennsylvania, but we do work in Maryland and we have some properties in New York. But for a relatively small family-owned business, we have high standards and we want everybody that we work with to meet those same standards. 
And we have courage of conviction. So we say whatever needs to be said to everybody, but we do that in a respectful way. And that's one of our key tenets, that we really try to not hold back. We need, we need to say what needs said. So if it's a good idea, you support it. If it's a bad idea, you say it's a bad idea. But we always say that in a respectful way. We talk about accountability. And that is um, integrity of keeping our commitments to one another. We consider ourselves very flexible. Uh, we are anticipatory and we're resilient. So some guys that are in our type of business, all they do are apartment construction, or all they do is warehousing, or all they do is retail, or all they do would be office. We have crossed every one of those segments, and we think we're pretty good at it, but we are um, opportunistic in what we do. We will build houses, we'll build apartments, we'll build warehousing, but we try to do that keeping in mind, you know, is it a good business, does it tie into our strategy? We talk about teamwork. Um, we work closely together, we learn from each other, and we you know, look at challenges as an opportunity. And everybody works as a team. I, you know, it's important that we, you know, we all pull our wagon, the load that's in it, and at times we help others pull their wagons, and it's important. And professional growth. You know, we are very supportive of education within the company. Uh, we have a program where people can go to, you know, on to you know, further their education. And we help pay for that. We want everybody to get their professional designations. And we're, we think it's a very important aspect. So um, those are the core values. And then we have our guiding principles. And these guiding principles are, they focus our actions. These are how we make decisions in our business, in our company. And it's very important that when we look at these, I think there's eight or nine of them. Sorry, I went too far. Um, if we can answer eight of these things, or seven or nine or whatever it is, then we say it's a good decision. But if we only get a positive answer to four or five of these, it's usually not on strategy. So this really, gives these points of strategy alignment is number one up there. Is it on strategy for us? Is this what we're thinking in our three-year plan we should be doing it? Does it have value creation? Are we able to create value for ourselves or value for the customer? From a customer service commitment, can we deliver to the customer what we think we're going to build or create here? Does it enhance the customer experience? If we get positive answers to that, we'll go forward. Is it innovative thinking? So does it move us ahead? Does it raise the bar in our industry? So is this something we should be thinking about because it's moving us further down the road? Continuous improvement. If we do this, can we be good at it? Can we create an idea? Can we be very good at it? Can we provide excellence in real estate services by doing this? Does it give us a competitive advantage? Is this something that sets us apart from the, co the other competitors that we work with? And we have a lot of friendly competitors, and we know each other. We compete all the time. But does it make us a little better than them in some way? Differentiation. Does it differentiate us? Does it set us apart from the pack? So as opposed to having a little bit of an advantage, is it something from a branding perspective that someone may look and go, you know, I got to call Triple Crown because I know they do that. They're, they're, the way they do it's a little different and I like the way they do it. People management. Can our people manage this process? Can, will it help them grow? Will it help them raise their professional standards? Will it? Uh, is it's, do we have the people and the bandwidth within the company to do this? Risk. We always are balancing risk from investment dollars, commitment of capital, commitment of people, commitment of time. Is the risk worth the effort? Is the return worth making this effort for this, whatever we're looking at? And then we look at it from a fiscal responsibility aspect. You know, making this, which is a little bit different from risk. Risk is the aspect of you know, taking this on and failing at it. 
The other aspect of fiscal responsibility is it prudent investment. Can you do this? Because you have a universe of investments you're always looking at, but you have a finite amount of capital to invest in that. So the question is, should we do this deal or should we put the money over in this deal? And balancing all these questions that are up there, three, six, what is it, 10 there, if we're getting eight, nine positive answers to that, it's probably something we should be doing. So that's how we make decisions in the company. I was just gonna give uh, a few metrics on the, on the business since you know, my involvement with it. And uh, our gross income in 1990 was about five and a half million dollars. And today we're gonna do close to $55 million this year. When I came into the business, we had 102 residential units, and today we have 1,181. We're actually in the process of completing another 150 units um, in the Harrisburg market in uh, Lower Allen Township called Brooks Edge, uh, and that's in uh, the final stages of construction right now. And on commercial square footage, which includes you know, our, all of our retail, office, and industrial buildings, we had about 95,000 square feet when I started, and we're very close to 2 million square feet of uh, space that we own and manage at this, at this point. So, um, challenging decisions. Before I get to that, I guess what I'm gonna tell you that on these decisions, not much keeps me up at night, you know, whether um, from a perspective of, you know, do we have enough employees to do this? Is this job going well? Is our banking sources secure? I don't worry about those things too much. You know, because I work hard, I have a great team of people that work with me, and with that support, you kind of following that decision-making process on our core values, you kind of have a good confidence when you leave at the end of every day that things are going in the right direction. And I'm sure you guys are aware, you know, every day there's problems, something happens, your uh, audio doesn't work on your uh, video or something like that. But you always, you know, you kind of walk out at the end of the day and go, I did good. But the decisions that I deal with on a family business, and this is another, I, these are all gonna come in one at a time, but you're seeing them as I click the whole picture shows to you. But the first generation sales in 1997 from my dad to my brother John and myself. And basically, you know, I came back in around 90, worked six, seven years, you know, under the guidance of my father. And probably what I think was his best decision, he may not agree with me, but I think it is, is that he had the foresight and he knew he had a limited bandwidth. He was not good at hiring people. He was not great at managing people. But I mean, the guy is extremely entrepreneurial. The thoughts he would have, the ideas he would come up with, but execution was not great. But he did have the decision-making ability 20 years ago when he was still very active that he said, I can't do this. And he sold the business to my brother and myself, 100%. He retained no stock, he retained no board positions, he walked out the door. And fortunately, my brother and I were able to grow this business, and from the previous slide, you were able to see you know, some of the growth we were able to attain in the last 20 years. Well, three years ago, my brother decided he was done building. He just didn't want to do it anymore. So he was 50 years old and he made a decision to sell 100% of his interest to me. So I'm the sole shareholder of the company right now. Now that was a very difficult decision. It was difficult for both of us because I mean you're, you're attached shoulder to shoulder, well hip to hip, shoulder to shoulder, you're attached financially because most of what I've shown you in these numbers, my brother John and I own together. Now he did not sell those assets, he sold his interest in Triple Crown, which is the construction company. But difficult decision, he made that, and he is now running for uh, state senator uh, in the Dolphin County uh, area. And that election's coming up uh, next November, so vote early, vote often. But. Uh, 
that's a pretty big life-changing decision when you've spent your entire life in the construction industry building things, but he's made that decision. So now, I have a son that's 27. He's in the business with me now, and he's working as a, as a senior in a leadership position as a construction manager. So like in our world, you have the superintendent that's out there building, running the job. Laborers and carpenters are working under the superintendent. Over the superintendent is the term called a project manager. He kind of coordinates the construction process through hiring the contractors, issuing the POs, um, managing the process. And then above that is a construction manager who kind of oversees, troubleshoots all issues in all areas of construction. And then we have a senior director of construction who runs that whole division of the company for me. So he's 27. I have another son that's 25. He's in his third year of law school at um, North, University of North Carolina. So he's going to graduate, and we've discussed, what are you going to do? Well, he's going to stay south, and he's going to work. But he told me he's going to work for a law firm, he thinks. And in, in three to five years, he was hoping to come back and maybe work for the, our company. And then I have a daughter who's 23, and she is a very uh, um, entrepreneurial, very creative young woman. She went to England and she works, uh, she got her master's in corporate communication out of Manchester, and she decided to stay in England, and she's gotten a job at the National Health Service. But She's talked to me about coming back to the business maybe at some point in time. So I have these third generation decisions that I'm trying to cope with, which are really the ones that you really struggle with. And when you really think about it though, you run it back through these questions of core values. Do they have the competency? Is it the right decision from a risk perspective? people perspective, customer service perspective. So these are the things that I just wanted you guys to know that I think about. These are the things that keep me up at night. You know, what, how am I transitioning this family business to the third generation? And I, the statistics I'm going to give you are not, don't you know, quote these verbatim, but most businesses don't transition to the second generation at all. If you look at the numbers, it's like an 80% failure rate. Either the business is sold, it goes bankrupt, something happens. And to get a business to go into the third generation, it takes as much strategic planning, it takes as much management of the process as it does running your business. So that's a Real quick overview of you know who we are, how we operate, things that I think about, and um, I'm going to open it up to questions. If anybody wanted to ask questions, we can just have a free dialogue at this point. Yes, sir. You don't have to pick your favorite, but do you feel like any of your kids are more qualified to run the company than the other ones? Well, that's a good question, and that the, the question was, do I, out of the kids, is there a favorite, or is there one that I think is more qualified than the other? And obviously, my oldest son, who's in the business now, we have a lot of dialogue about this, and um, I've told him, you know, you want, you want your superstars to run forward. You want them to be successful and gain experience, and yet, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm pulling the reins back a little bit, because I try to explain, when I took the business over, there were probably, I don't even know the number, eight, nine employees. We were doing $3 million worth of work. We have, you know, we're doing $50 million worth of work. We have you know, three true divisions. I have, you know, three separate vice presidents that operate, you know, these sections. And it's a much longer learning curve to um, pick up this company today than it was 20 years ago. So I'm still getting to your answer. My one son is great at construction. He loves it. And I think he could operate that division. My other son, got his, he has a master's in finance. He went to Clemson University. He's given his law degree. Totally different skill set. And I know he could run a, a division of the company. Who but neither one is at this point in their life is capable of running the business. They just don't have the bandwidth. 
and we have a, another little section of the company. We own four different golf courses. So in that business, I at this peak in the um, summertime, we probably have a, you know 250 employees over there in the in the golf side of the company, and um, that's really not the company. Those are separate investments. They're not part of Triple Crown. They're just different investments. And my daughter worked over there in the. Um, for the golf courses for a number of years. And I think she has you know, the capacity to do that. But what has changed with our business right now, anybody, there's not a 25 year old, I think, in the world that could run this industry, our business, because they just don't have the experience. So I think you'd have, like any other larger company, you know, they have you know, executive high potential program and they kind of train people and give them time over all these uh, different areas. And then in a five, six, seven year time frame, they pick a leader out of that group. So the answer is I don't know right now. <laughs> yes? Do you have any key employees that would be more, might be more appropriate to take over because they've been with you through the growth process? Yes, we have um, key employees. Do we have key employees? It's, it's amazing to me now. I'm celebrating you know, 25th anniversaries of employees that started with me. Now that speaks volumes about the company. One, we have people that were willing to stay 25 years and work with us. And it's, you've become very friendly with those people. So I, behind, from my position, I have one woman that's in charge of all divisions of the company underneath me. And she's had 26 years with the company. Her name's Deb Hodges, and her title's Senior Vice President of Operations. But you know, I'm having these discussions with Deb. She's talking about retirement now. So I'm not ready to retire. So, uh, but I, you know, we've talked. She says, I have a five, six year runway here, and I'm out. So we're thinking about developing new leadership in the company. Who's gonna take that position? Our CFO, Jeff Kurtika, he's, uh, been there like two months longer than Deb. He was one of my first hires at the company. And uh, he, he, as a CFO, he knows where all the skeletons are. You know, he's been with us from the beginning. So he's, you know, he does all the tax returns. He knows everything about the business and an absolute key guy. But you know, even Jeff, who he runs that side of the business, does not have an interest in running the entire business. So at, there are key people, and we are constantly trying to groom people within our business to take over other positions. And you know, kind of the, one of the things we do say at the company, the only way you're moving forward is you got to hire and train your replacement before you, you, know, you go into a position. We'll never move anybody up until they hire and train their replacement. So we, we, that's part of the professional growth I was talking about. Yes? In your bio, it was discussed um, how most of the success goes with the creation of the management team. Yes. How did you go about creating that management team? The question is, how did we create a successful management team? And, you know, there's a lot of things with all the education you're going to get, whether you finish or you go on with college or you go on to postgraduate. There are things that you just can't be taught. And hiring good people is a tough, it's, it's very intuitive. And I've seen so, and I've learned so much. I, don't, I'm, I think now I'm just beginning to get good at hiring. <laughs> but I, the, the two key people I mentioned, Def and Jeb, were just great hires. And I think that was more by accident than skill. But to hire good people today, we do a thing that's called a predictive index. And it's a company out of um, Florida. It's kind of a personality. Uh, first you do, we as a company fill out a document that says these are all the traits we think this job is important for. So like in accounting, you know, if you're trying to hire a bookkeeper, you know, repetitive, you're working in the same position. We put all these things, you're working with computers a long, you know, long time, you have to you know, be able to do detailed mathematical analysis. We put all these information into what we think this position is. And then whoever comes in, they fill out a, one, a simple two-page, uh, it's really, it's just one words, words on page, and you circle every word on that that you think applies to you. We send that down to the company and they merge the two 
and they say whether this person has the is a match from what we think the skills need. So if it's like a superintendent, you got to be able to work outside, you know, lift a certain amount of weight, high sense of urgency, have to be able to deal with problems um, every day. We put all this information in. But also, we find that multiple interviews with multiple people in the company help make those decisions better. So no one person will not do an interview and hire that person. And we usually like to have a person that's working below that p position to interview, a person and above that position, and a third person on the interview. And then we also do multiple interviews. We won't make a decision on one, one point in time. And when we're working at a senior leadership position in the company, uh, we usually make our interviews last between five and eight hours. And with that, it may sound crazy, but you know, we'll get in the car, we'll drive around to job sites, we'll walk them around, we'll really start talking to them, we'll sit down, we'll have lunch with them, we'll see what their mannerisms is, we might even have dinner with them. And then you really begin to break a person down, because everybody's gonna come in for the first 20 minutes and life's you know, wonderful, everything's good. <laughs> but once you really spend six, seven, eight hours with a person, you begin to find out a little more who they are. So that's how we hire for senior positions. You know, if we're hiring a laborer, that interview might only be an hour. It's, it's just, you're not different, um, just a whole different skill set you're looking for. So, I think I got lucky on those first two hires. They stayed with me for 27 years and they've been critical uh, to the success of the business. But there is a real science to hiring people and the more you, I've learned this, the more effort you put in up front on that process, the better result you'll get in the end. Because the last thing you want to do is hire somebody three, four weeks and find out they are not the right fit. And when I, I mean from personality to skill set, it is so costly to bring people in and then have to replace them. Yes, sir. Do you feel like, um since you're not practicing law right now, do you feel like you're wasting your time in law school? Or do you feel like it's That's a great question. I've had that asked a lot of times for me that, you know, why would you go to law school if you're not going to practice law? And then I've, from my personal recommendation, I would recommend a law degree over the MBA as a business education. And the reason I say that, whatever you do today, the law touches it. If you're trying to do a contract for a single family home or a $20 million construction contract for an office building, you're dealing with the law. On your insurance issues, you're dealing with the law. You're offsetting risks and you have to legally put that in documents to move the risk away. When you're dealing with human resources, when you're hiring people, it's you're dealing with the law. I mean, you, you know, just think of the Supreme Court cases, you know, that have dealt with human relation issues, you know, marriage, what's the definition of marriage, who gets to have benefits. You're dealing with the law in every aspect of business. You deal with finance, and, the re, and I'll get on, I'm, finance is a whole nother issue, but I look at business pretty simple. You know, my pro formas are pretty simple. I don't look at internal rates of return. I look at, you know, cash flow day one, return on equity, return on investment. If I can't pretty much put all my numbers on a single page of paper and know the deal makes sense, I'm not doing it. But when it comes to finance and you start signing mortgages and notes and assignments of rents and all the other legal documents, you need to know what you're looking at. So from my aspect, running the business, doing the maths, the easy part, managing the people and the implications of the law across everything you do, I found it to be the most valuable part of my education. I'd give up the masters and keep with the law degree from my perspective. Any other questions? Yes? Um, how does your company set yourself apart from like competitors? Like, what do you think that like you guys do that other companies don't? And who are your competitors? Well, 
our competitors range you know, very because we have a, a very diverse portfolio. You know, there's some people that just are home builders, and we do compete with those. So, you know, in the Harrisburg marketplace, you guys have probably seen the signs around. You know, Keystone's Homes, Charter Homes, Yinks Homes, McNaughton Homes. We compete with them daily. Um, on the industrial front, you know, we build office buildings and warehouses, so you might have seen the names, you know, High Construction, Kinsley Construction, Gem, Quandell, those are our competitors in that world. <coughs> On property management, Horst out of Lancaster, PMI out of Harrisburg, those are people we compete with. So in each one of those areas, we differentiate ourselves, I think, a little bit. From a normal property management company, I think we have a higher level of financial controls and I think we operate management like owners, which a lot of management companies don't. I mean, we constantly look at tax appeals, ability to reduce you know, real estate taxes. We look at everything as an owner and that, as, I don't know how to manage anything else other than thinking we own it. And sometimes <laughs> we get a little overzealous, that may be a bad part of that. But uh, that's how we look at it. So on the property management, that's how we differentiate ourselves. On the construction side, um, we, are, we won the National Housing Quality Award. And that is a very rigorous, you know, if it's run by the National Housing uh, Association, National Home Builders Association. And we are considered a, a small volume home builder but and they break it into two large and small volume and uh, but we won that on a national scale so how did we do that you, it, there's a lot of detail but it's in the you know it's in the details where you get successful so we have a quality partner program we interview our contractors our suppliers annually we have what are called QACs quality assurance checklists that are on every job every contractor that completes a phase of construction has to turn that in with their billing we conform, confirm that those you know, quality controls have all been met. So in that area, we're very, we are much more, I believe, process driven as a company than most builders are. We have very detailed processes and that is, you've heard the term probably, scalable and repeatable. And if you got a process that everybody can learn that's scalable and repeatable, it's easy to train people and it's easy to grow the company. So from the construction side, we are uh, very quality and process driven. And then the third segment there, from a development perspective, where we buy and acquire, acquire ground and develop it, I think we just have a very strong team between our legal team, our engineering team, and our design team that we are very capable of being able to look at a piece of ground and t decide whether that is best to be a residential community or whether it's better to be industrial or retail. So I think those are some of the things that differentiate us from the competition. Yes, sir. No, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, since you guys are so diversified, do you feel like you don't do as well in some areas because other companies are more specialized? Do you feel like it helps? That's another great question. And yes, I have thought, the question is, do, because we do so much, are we jacks of all trades and masters of none? And I think about that at times. And I guess I've always answered it this way. Um, we've probably missed a lot of opportunities because we have not stayed focused in one core segment you know, being you know siloed strictly in the apartment business or siloed strictly in the shopping center business but i keep a list in our uh, our business summary of every project we've ever developed and i think we're up to like 178 jobs that you know communities that we have developed since my involvement and there are only <coughs> two jobs we ever lost money on. So maybe we're not the best at everything, but we don't miss the target too often. And when we do, on those two jobs, we didn't lose much money. So, you know, we're still around, we're still successful, but I tend to lean where I was talking about earlier, our ability to be flexible and adjust 
and see different market trends has allowed us to do a lot more things than some others have. So I do think about it. Should I just stay focused in the apartments business? Should I you know, go out of state, try to grow it? I don't know that there's a right answer to that, but I guess uh, we're still here, you know, opening the doors. So that's the answer I have. I do think about it. Yes, ma'am. Are your workers unionized? And like, if they are, do you, how do you deal with that from the business perspective? We are not unionized. And we very, very rarely do scale work, or, you know, unionized work. Um, this area, central Pennsylvania, is not very unionized. If you go to Pittsburgh or you go, you go to Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, it tends to be much more union oriented. And it's very tough to run two shops, a union shop out of the same company and then a non-union shop out of the same company. We found it that way. We have done some scale work and it's, just, it's usually been problematic for us. But I, I just give you a quick story on that. We own a property down in Philadelphia and the tenant is unionized and they work all on heavy equipment like school buses, tractor trailers, that's all they do. So all the mechanics are unionized. And we had to put a new roof on the building. So I was going to bring one of the contractors out of Harrisburg to do the roof down in Philadelphia and the storage, uh, union store of the mechanics came out and said, you're not union. The guy goes, no. And he went in, he goes, we're striking. So the owner of the business that rented from us called me and said, you've got to use a union contractor. I said, well, we don't have to. It's, it's not legally binding under the lease that we have to union, union employees. Well, the roof was about 150000 from my guy out of Harrisburg. We got union bids out of Philly. It was two fifty, And I went back to the tenant. I said, it's going to cost $100,000 more to put this roof on through a union shop out of Philadelphia. And he wrote the check for 100,000. He said, use them. I can't have my guys strike. So it, it really didn't pertain to your question, but those are some of the issues you deal when you, you know, in a union world. So it's a, it's a very different world than the uh, non-union sector of construction. Yes, sir. Do you deal directly with a lot of tenants and stuff? Or, um, are you more like focused on the business itself? I don't deal with most tenants on a daily basis. If we're working on a large, I don't know if you guys, everybody familiar with Ollie's Bargain Outlet? Has, um, they're a retailer in the area. They just went public. I did a job for them. We built an 800,000 square foot building down in York. And that was a lease, build to suit lease. Now that one I was involved with very personally. It was a $32 million transaction. and. I needed to have my hands around that one. On the day-to-day -day operations, no. I mean, I, we have you know, leasing agents, we have property managers that deal with that on a daily basis. But I kind of just dovetail into the question. That's what's given me so much diversity, being able to work in it. Starting when the company only had 102 units, yeah, I used to you know, could get up on Saturdays, I'd go out and shovel dirt with the guys and you know, I had my son you know, along with me and uh, I worked in all aspects. I did leasing, I did sales, I did finance, I did a lot of different things, but growing from a small company, we were able to do that. But today there's just too much going on. I don't deal with much on a daily basis operationally. Yes. That's a good point. And uh, the question is, you know, do you like the hands-on work or as you grow the business, you just deal with a lot more issues that are non-construction related. So I answer it this way. I like cutting the grass because you have a very defined beginning and a very defined end. And when you're done, it's neat, it's clean, and you go, I did a good job. Some days, you know, when you're dealing with you know, an insurance issue that be, may last months, and you're in depositions or if you're in a lawsuit or something, and it seems like it's so much negative energy. 
Like you're like, I am, this has nothing to do with providing housing for people or building buildings or building roadways or whatever. So it's, to some days it's tough, you know, to be, you'd say, I'd like to just be able to go out there and dig a ditch and you know, just have a beginning and an end and know you were able to complete a job. Um, there are days you get very uh, frustrated with the, um, with the governance. And our business, the construction business, is highly regulated. When you think of what we do to get municipal approvals to build something, the building permits, you have electrical inspectors, you have building inspectors, you have you know, NPDES permits, EPA, you have county conservation, you can't have erosion, you know, sedimentation runoff. You've got, and besides that, then you have all the neighbors inspecting everything you do. I mean, we are in a very highly regulated industry, even though sometimes, you, know, you may not think so, but we have, you know, OSHA, we have safety programs, we do, you know, we have inspections by OSHA, we have inspection by the insurance company. It's a very regulated industry that we're, that we're involved with. Yes, sir. Would you say that sometimes there's no end? How many hours a week would you estimate that you work, in all honesty, with being the CEO of the family business? No, my my work week is crazy, and I probably bring a lot of that on myself. I get in the office every morning at 7 a.m., and I very rarely leave before 6 p.m. And I work every Saturday. And I probably shouldn't. I don't know that I have to, but I like what I do. And I guess if there's any one piece of advice, you know, when you, when you think about what you guys are going to end up doing after you graduate, you got to like what you do. I mean, it's not about making the money. You're making money is a means to an end. You, if you're going to spend 35 years or some time frame, whatever it is, working at something, you better enjoy what you're doing. So I get a lot of... Uh, <laughs> complaints about my work hours, but I like it. I enjoy it. So I put a lot of time in. Has, have those hours increased since your kids have moved on? Or do you wish that going back in time that you would have taken more time away from work ever? Or do you think that the birth of the business was question is, did I work too much and have I had regrets on that in, in raising family or anything else? Um, I work very, very hard. I play very, very hard. So I probably take six, I don't know, maybe six to seven weeks vacation a year. And when I go, I go. So I've, um, one of the best things I did, I took a trip, I took all the kids to Europe on a cruise and we were gone for, uh, I think it was like 27 days. And that's back when you didn't have email. And uh, I mean, I was gone. There were, you know, phone calls were difficult to make, the kids were little, but I, I left. And when I came back, I sat at my desk, I went through all my mail in one day and I was back on a normal path. So that gave me a lot of confidence with the people I was working with, that they, they ran the business. I was gone 27 days and, and life went on. But my point is, I take the time, I leave, and then I, I check out. So I, and I've just signed up, uh, I'm taking 45 days off next year. I'm going to uh, bicycle from Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine. So I'll be gone for 45 days on that trip. Yes. Do you think your example of like working hard and taking vacation, is that going through your management? Like, do you allow your um, employees and your upper management to take long vacations and work extra hours? Yes. Um, we, it's a family business, and I firmly believe family first. Um, I'll tell you an interesting story. Deb Hodges, uh, her kids are about my kids' age. I said she's been with us 27 years. It was like the first year she was working for us. She finally came in, she goes, I have to take off. She goes, you know, one of my kids sick. And I'm like, Deb, go. Do you need any help? You need me to do anything? You want me to pick your daughter up at daycare or whatever? Go take care of your son. 
And she said she was afraid to ask for time off because she thought it would be held against her. And I'm like, well, that's not our culture at all. And she, that is one of the things she has uh, said so great about the company. I mean, we will help anybody in a family issue. You know, Deb has a house now down at the shore, and during the summertime, she leaves Thursday night and comes back Monday. So she, you know, she takes Friday, Monday off, half a Monday. She's usually back, but that's what she likes. She likes the beach now. So we're very, you know, but during the winter, she's there every day and you know works real hard. So we're we're very flexible with that. You know, good people. It's so hard to get good people, and you got to treat them right. And believe me, in our pers from my perspective, and I, I hope it's a cultural thing in our business. Families first, take and then, you know, and take the time you need. Anything else? Well, with that, I'll say thank you. I appreciate being invited and allowing to share some of my story.